Thank you, thank you. Um, welcome and good afternoon, and I'm really pleased to be here today to talk about this incredibly important subject, and it's my opinion that a transition into memory care is probably the most difficult decision that a family member would have to make when we start looking at where do we place our loved one in a long-term care um, placement facility and memory care, that decision is the most difficult. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about what I do. I oversee the healthcare operations uh, within Air Force Village's continuing care retirement community, and that includes skilled nursing facilities, it includes assisted living, home health, and hospice, and it also includes Freedom House. And Freedom House is a 72-bed Alzheimer's assisted living facility. It has been my privilege to be involved with that directly uh, since it opened in 1998. So I can tell you that I've counted about 250 admissions into that memory care facility in this past 12 years. So hopefully today I can give you a little bit of advice and a little bit of guidance to try to make this decision process and this transition a little bit easier for you and obviously for your loved one. I'm going to talk about um, three entities today that are involved in this process. Of course, there is the person that is diagnosed with dementia, there is the family or the decision makers, the responsible party, and then there's the facility that has been selected into which you are moving your loved one into. This can be the most difficult decision and transition process because most often that person diagnosed with dementia does not have the ability to participate or assist you in this planning process. Why is that? Dementia, unfortunately, leaves that person with very little, if any at all, insight into what their own deficits are. And those of us who work with dementia, we know that person is usually in, in denial, uh, that lack of insight into what their deficits are. They don't need any help, um, according to them. And the more we try to convince them that they need help, the more suspicious, the more argumentative, the more paranoid they become. And this is just by virtue of their disease process alone. It's the diagnosis. Talking about the diagnosis uh, briefly, if you've ever heard me speak about dementia, you will know that I um, really drive home the value of getting an, a diagnosis that identifies what type of dementia we are dealing with. And this is important on so many levels. But specifically for family members, you need to be able to understand what type of dementia your loved one has so that it can help you plan and make informed decisions. And yes, it is true that many of the dementias have significant similarities across the board, but more importantly, for the different di diagnoses such as Lewy body or Alzheimer's or frontotemporal lobe or vascular, there are enough differences that you need to be aware of that are going to help you plan and do what's in the best interest of your loved one. So when we talk about that person that has relatively little insight um, into their deficits, it's really frustrating and it, it really puts all the load on identifying the need and making the decision on the family. So next we're going to talk a little bit about the family member or that person who's responsible for making those decisions. This is by far one of the most devastating disease processes that we see when we're dealing with Alzheimer's or Lewy body dementia and, and the other progressive terminal dementias. And a lot of times the family member, they're also caught up in different family dynamics. And I'm sure that some of you can relate to, um, and I know I've seen it in, in the last you know, decade or more, where some of the family dynamics make it very difficult for the individual who has been directed to make the decisions. Perhaps there's a sibling that lives out of state and uh, doesn't agree with the decision process, doesn't think mom or dad need that level of care. Uh, we've also seen where, you know, we have a role reversal. So if the decision maker is making decisions for a family member, that's often very difficult if that family member was a parent. Uh, again, you've got that role reversal going on. Or if there's a spouse who needs to make a decision for their loved one, that's really hard to let go of. Uh, you know, there's a lot of emotions that are involved and a lot of things going on with that decision making process that just complicate things. But we really have to look at what is in the best interest of the person with that dementia. 
it's impossible to think that any one person can provide the services that that individual needs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That is really, that is a huge task and it's going to affect the physical and mental well-being of that care provider. On occasion, um, I have seen where an individual diagnosed with dementia, perhaps it's very early stage Alzheimer's, perhaps it's a vascular dementia, uh, but on rare occasions I have seen individuals that have been diagnosed actually take part in that decision-making process and that planning process. They still have enough insight, they are in tune to things are going wrong, and they start having very open conversations with their family members and making that decision. When that happens, I'm just gonna throw this advice out there, if that occurs, family members, you need to take advantage of that because as the disease progresses, that's gonna be lost. So if you do have those rare cases where the individual themselves start identifying they need more services, you need to jump on that and take advantage of it. Next, I wanna talk about um, the facility itself. Obviously, if we're looking at and we're talking about transitioning into memory care, we're talking about transitioning into a facility. So uh, most likely it's going to be perhaps an assisted living that specializes in memory care, or you may actually need a long-term care facility, again, that specializes in memory care. That facility, just by virtue of performing dementia care uh, specifically, is going to be flexible. Uh, flexibility is key in, in any successful memory care unit or home or household or facility or whatever name you want to tag onto it, but flexibility is the key. That facility knows what a transition process takes and they are going to go ahead and ensure that the staff are all on board, we know when the new person is moving in, we know their needs, we know their wants, we know their likes, um, we also know of any issues that the family's made us aware of, you know, so we can try and guide and reduce any um, additional anxiety or unwarranted anxiety. So the facility really plays a key role in this as well. It's all about communicating and working together as a team, again, focusing on what is in the best interest of that individual. In, in, um, um, in my career so far, I have been asked um, two questions more than any other. And I'm sure if you're a family member watching this today, um, you may have this question you know, ready to post it. And these are the two million dollar questions. The first one is, when do I know it's time to transition my loved one into memory care? The second one is, do I tell my loved one that this is what we're doing? I will tell you that I have the answer to the first question. I don't have an answer to the second question. The first question is, how do I know? When do I know? When is the time for me to start looking at this transition? Let, let me start off by saying, perhaps your loved one already resides in an assisted living facility, uh, but they don't perform uh, memory care uh, programming. That answer is gonna be made for you by the facility itself because they're gonna identify that they can no longer meet this person's needs. So that decision is gonna be made for you. But if the individual is living at home, you really have to look at two factors. One, and, and most importantly, is safety. Is this person safe at home anymore? And if they're not safe at home anymore, you've gotta look at that transition and you've gotta make that decision. Safety includes a variety of factors. Are they um, out wandering? Are they leaving the home and out wandering in the streets where it's unsafe? Um, oh my gosh, are they still driving? Are they at risk for causing injury to themselves or others? Are they at risk for getting lost? I can tell you dozens and dozens of stories where individuals with dementia are still out driving and the keys are finally taken away when there's a serious accident or the person is found hundreds of miles away from their home lost, okay? So safety, getting lost, driving, those are huge issues. I, I would um, comment too that one of the things that we talk about um, a lot in, 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 in some group settings and whatnot, and we talk about dementia and signs and symptoms, 
any time that I'm driving down the highway here in San Antonio, I look at TransGuide. And nine times out of ten, TransGuide, if they are posting for the community to be alerted to a person being lost, it's usually an elderly person. And that just really gets me every time I, I drive by one of those and, and I see that posted. It means, once again, you know, there's somebody out there driving and um, they're lost, they have dementia, what's going on, where are they, I hope they're found safe. But that's one of your keys right there. Um, the other when we talk about safety, are they taking their medication? Um, are they taking it correctly? Are they making their doctor's appointments? Are they following their doctor's instructions? What are they doing? What are you doing um, with all the appliances in the household? Are they still cooking? You know, so what is the safety aspect to that person still living at home? And if there is help available, what is the safety factor for that person providing the care? Earlier we talked about you're acting and doing for two people, literally 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So safety is probably one of the number one factors that you need to look at. And if safety is in jeopardy, there's your decision. The other that I want to touch on uh, briefly that I don't think a lot of people think about or uh, pay as much attention to it or put as much importance on it as safety, and that is dignity. The dignity of the person with dementia. Are they, um, how's their hygiene? Um, how's their hair? Um, you know, the, the, the woman who never went outside without her hair done and her makeup on and, you know, dressed up and looking good. How is that, how's that still working? You know, the hair's unkept, the hygiene is poor, the clothes may be stained. That's a dignity issue. How are their social skills when they're going out in public? Um, that's a dignity issue. Are they even going out in public anymore, or are they being kept closed in and away from the rest of the community because there is an embarrassment factor there? So dignity also needs to be thought about when you're asking that question, how do I know it's time to move towards that transition and make the decision? The real million dollar question though, and the one that I said I don't have an answer to is, do I tell my loved one that we're moving him or her, um, you know, into a memory care unit. I don't know the answer to this. Um, I can share with you experiences. I can share with you a little bit of insight and advice. But ultimately, the decision is on you. And you have to base that decision on several factors. You have to really sit down and understand what is the level of dementia that this person has. Uh, what are other conversations that we've had that they have become um, upset about or it's increased their level of anxiety, uh, it, it's added additional stress? Um, how do I think they're going to accept this? Um, have I talked to the physician about really where are they in their disease process? Is this something they can even rationalize anymore or not? I would say that, and we talked a little bit earlier about, there are some cases and some instances, but they're usually pretty rare where the person diagnosed can take part in that decision-making process. Usually my experience has shown me that that's not usually the case. Sometimes it's not best just to tell it like it is. You cannot argue and convince that person you need this help, you need this assistance, you can't live home alone anymore, this is what we're going to do. That is really a tough, tough decision though, and I think that's um, probably the, the biggest one that most family members really struggle with in, in this process. Um, I, I would say to you though that in today's day and age, we have the world at our fingertips. With the internet and the World Wide Web, we can go online and we can look up topics and we can do research, and that's why it's important to understand what type of dementia does that person have as well. And that just empowers you a little bit more so that you can start making informed decisions and really start planning this process. I will tell you that um, um, over the years I I've seen different techniques used when it comes to the actual transition decision and what the individual with dementia, what they're told. I have seen where a family member has told a loved one, um, we're going out to lunch. Um, they happen to go to the facility for lunch and that's that. Um, I have seen where family members um, identify to the loved one, 
you know, your doctor wants you here for a little while so we can start monitoring changes in your medication or perhaps that, that individual with dementia, um, depending on what stage they're in and what other disease processes they have, they may be really focused in on um, another condition that they have. So um, I've seen family members where they've identified to the loved one, you know, the doctor wants you here for a little while to monitor your medications for your X, you know, syndrome or whatever. Um, that, I, I've seen good results with that one. If the person with dementia has a good relationship and, and a good trust into their doctor, I've, I've actually seen very good results with that one. I've seen family members tell loved ones as well, um, you know, we're doing remodeling at the house or we're doing this at the house and you need to be out for a while. Um, you know, I, I've seen numerous um, little white lies, if you will, um, being told. I've also seen sometimes where it's just not telling the truth, um, it's just omitting the truth and family members just continue to um, divert the conversation and redirect it and waiting for after that move in that individual to become accustomed to their surroundings and eventually just settle in and believe it or not as I said earlier 250 plus admissions that I've witnessed personally 95 percent of those over a period of time adjust very well and the questions don't come out anymore and the anger and the anxiety and the stress is not there anymore and while this disease is devastating and it's heartbreaking and, and I know that there's some sense that well the disease also allows them to forget and stop questioning and settle in and accept what their new home and their new lifestyle has become and they're quite content in it so it's really a difficult balancing act, um, but as I said earlier, I don't have the answer if you were searching for do I tell them or not. I think this is an individual decision. It's one that you really have to look at and really dissect and investigate and um, do your research and talk to other family members, talk to the physician, talk to the facility. But regardless of what you do, Whatever that decision is, whatever you are telling this loved one, make sure that everybody knows. Um, everybody's got to be on the same page. Everybody's got to be, you know, singing the same tune on this one. So that is what I will tell you um, th that is very important. I would say that, um, uh, you know, once we've made the decision and you've identified, yes, it is time to, number one, move my loved one into a memory care unit. Um, number two, I've gotten over that hurdle of what I'm going to tell mom or dad or my wife. And uh, number three, now I'm actually to the plan of the actual move. I cannot stress enough that it is so important to make sure that you plan this from step one all the way through to fruition. This has got to be a well-orchestrated plan, again, where everybody's involved, everybody's included, and everybody's on the same page. And you've got to have contingency plans. What if this doesn't happen in this step? What if this doesn't happen? You've got to have this planned out because the person that is going to benefit from a well-orchestrated plan is the resident that we're moving in. Uh, the person that is going to be affected by a poor planning process, again, is the resident that we're moving in. So extremely important. What do you have to plan for? Um, well, you have to identify, first of all, what am I bringing in that belongs to this person? Wherever you're moving them, this is their new home. And that's what it should look like, and that's what it should feel like. It's got to be their home. So you need to furnish it and decorate it with the belongings and, and the things that this person knows and is comfortable with that's going to give them that sense of comfort. Um, so you've got to plan that out. You also have to think about clothing and all those items. It's like you're moving them to a new apartment, a new home. You have to plan that out. You don't pack everything up, though, and start moving things in front of the person that has dementia. Now, remember again, there are a few, it's rare, but there are a few cases where the person with dementia is actually going to take part in the decision and the planning process. Very rare again, but if that's the case, that's great. 
um, but usually that's not the case. And to start packing somebody's belongings in front of them and to start moving things out in front of them, for again, that person that has um, cognitive deficits, you're going to create anxiety and stress. So you want to avoid that at all costs. One of the measures that uh, we've recommended is that you bring in um, a family member or a friend and somebody takes that individual out for an outing, a pleasant outing. And that allows um, you know, the, the, the second team, if you will, to come in, pack up those items that were identified and carefully identified and planned previously, pack them up, get them over to the new facility, and set up that room right down to hanging up the pictures if need be. Um, you've got to have that room set up. I will tell you of a disastrous um, a trans transition that, that just sticks in my mind. And from that point on, we always said, no matter what, no matter what it takes, the room will be set up. And uh, we had a lady who was moving in and, um, uh, you know, everything, you know, the best, um, best laid plans went, went to heck. And when she came into the facility, in her room were boxes, half open, half not, things sticking out of them, um, you know, a, a, a bed that wasn't made, um, a dresser that was cockeyed, it wasn't set up, you know, in the room, it wasn't positioned. And, you know, I witnessed firsthand the level of anxiety that that elicited from th this poor lady. Um, she basically you know, almost like, like a mini meltdown. It was horrible. And we could have avoided all of that if we had just had everything all set up for her. Now, I'm not saying that they're going to walk in and say, oh, that's my stuff. This is great. Thank you so much. You know, most likely not. You know, the question is going to be, how did my stuff get here? Who moved my stuff? Who's, who said you could move my stuff? You're going to have those questions, and you're going to learn how to redirect those conversations um, and actually become a master, if you will, of conversations uh, with a person with dementia. But you can redirect that and make that a much easier situation versus the one where people are moving their belongings in and out and things are just, you know, strewn along a room. It, it creates a lot of anxiety. Um, so... One of the other um, items that uh, we always want to plan for when a person is actually moving into that memory care is you always want to plan for the worst case scenario. And I found that in my experience, when we plan for the absolute worst case scenario, it turns out great, um, but not always. So you really need to plan for, for those moments. Um, what are we going to do if the person becomes combative? What are we going to do if the person continues to try to exit the facility? What are we going to do? You know, we need to stop and think about those things. And that's why it's important for the family and the facility to have these very open conversations from day one. Well, prior to day one, because day one will be moving, right? But from the day that you decide that this is where you're transferring your loved one to, you and that facility staff need to be communicating. Again, a dementia facility is going to be prepared to handle these situations. And I will tell you up front, I'm not an advocate for using medications to reduce anxiety. However, there are occasions when it is required, and it's all about weighing the risk and the benefit. But again, those are conversations between the family, the facility, and if we're talking about medications, now we need to include the physician, uh, definitely. These are not long-term solutions. Again, when this does happen, very limited um, occasions that, that we've had to do this, but when it does happen, it's very minimal dosages, uh, only temporary, and it's just, it, it's to, again, we've, we've weighed the risk and the benefit, okay? When we're moving that person into that memory care, uh, we need to stop and think about, okay, so we've got the room set up, we've picked out all their belongings, we've made it look like home, we've communicated very well with the family, um, we've identified worst case scenarios, we have a backup plan and a backup plan to that. Um, when do we bring them in? What, you know, do we just drop them off at the front door and, and leave? Um, you know, that, that's the other question. You know, families are really anxious about how do I do this? Um, you know, um, mom's just going to, you know, she's going to throw a fit and she's not going to get out of the car. Um, you'd be amazed. I've never seen anyone, you know, sit in the car and grab onto the car door and say, no, I'm not going. Um, you'd be amazed at, at how 
really how relatively, um, and I don't want to say the word easy like I'm throwing this off as, as if this isn't a challenge, but, you know, they get out of the car. They come in. Um, you know, you just tell them, you, you know, we're going to visit or we're going to have lunch. And I would say that lunch time is usually uh, the best time or, or during a meal time. Uh, because at that point, you're not just going into um, a facility um, and you're actually going into an activity. You're going into, um, you're taking advantage of an opportunity for your loved one to sit down and take part immediately in a common activity in that home. I would say that family members should also really consider about staying for that meal. Um, and enjoying that time and being the facilitator between their loved one and the other residents that live there. Get the conversation flowing. Get things going. Uh, it's going to ease your loved one. It's, it's going to make you feel a lot better because you're going to say, wow, you know, mom is already, you know, socializing with the ladies at the table and that was just a great feeling. Um, so that when you do leave, uh, you know, you're, you're left with that memory. Um, I would really avoid late afternoon, uh, definitely avoid any um, later evening admissions. And I would also say that, um, you know, you, again, communicating with the facility, because when you say you're going to arrive at X time, um, the facility's waiting, they're prepared. Uh, a good facility is also going to make sure that the staff have additional activities for that person that day, they're planning things to distract that person and really hone in on making them feel comfortable and um, not giving them that time or opportunity to start thinking about, wait a minute, you know, wh where are you going? Why are you leaving me here? Um, so, you know, so you drop, you drop them off, you have lunch, you, you take time, you spend some time, you help them transition um, in, into that little society of that home. Then it comes time for you to leave. This is also very tricky. You know, how do I leave? You need to engage the staff. The staff are going to help you in that process because um, leaving can be an extremely traumatic experience, not just for the person with dementia, but trust me, I have seen um, hundreds of family members leave that first day and end up in the parking lot, you know, in the car crying. This is a really difficult decision um, to make, but remember this. You have been trusted to make the best decisions for this person, and that's what you're doing, okay? So you're keeping them safe, and you're preserving their dignity, and, and you've had to select memory care to do that. Um, so you want to, again, when it's time to go, you want to engage the staff. And again, dementia care staff are going to know we are going to distract the person with dementia. We're going to get them engaged in something else so you can leave. Um, trust me when I say that eventually um, you're going to be able to say goodbye and leave and, you know, your loved one's going to walk you to the door and say goodbye and turn around and, you know, go take part in, in the, the community that they joined. Um, sometimes they don't. You know, sometimes it's a tough one. Where are you going? Why are you leaving me here? Why did you do this to me? Um, you know, all those questions and those accusations start coming out and, you know, you start struggling with how do I answer that? Well, number one, you can't convince them, you know, of why you made this choice. Again, you really need to just become the master of turning conversations around, um, you know, to identify other topics so you can start talking about other activities that you can engage in. Again, you know, there's, there's a little bit of, you know, silver lining here in this really, really dark cloud, and it's that the short-term memory you know, it's such a short span that you can usually redirect um, and they forget about that one question and they start taking part in something else. So uh, really have to be the, the master of that conversation. Um, I, uh, I've been asked numerous times as well, um, you know, and I've heard different philosophies about, well, after my loved one has moved in, I've been told that I shouldn't visit for a couple days or even a few weeks. Um, you know, is, is this true? Mm, I, again, there's no blanket answer to this. Uh, there's no cookie cutter response. I would say that, in my opinion, to not visit for several weeks is almost um, cruel. Um, it almost leads to like a sense of abandonment. And I would say that the visits are necessary. 
uh, to help that person transition, but you really have to do a balancing act. And you have to be talking with the staff as well. And you have to um, um, also gauge your own responses to this traumatic experience because it's traumatic for you as well. Remember, you are the well person. Um, you have the cognitive capabilities to rationalize why you've made these decisions and to deal with your emotions. The person with dementia does not. Okay, so you really have to keep that in mind. I would say that it is important that you seek support. Um, we talked about education. It's available. And there's also some great support programs out there in the community for you. You need to talk to other people. You need to understand that you're not the first person to go through this, and you need to hear other stories, and you guys need to lean on one another and support one another, and hopefully you can share experiences that will be beneficial to somebody else as they go through this process. I'm going to tell you um, two more, a couple more pieces of advice. Uh, one of the things that I've seen is that we will um, admit a person uh, with dementia into memory care, and because of the activities and because of the structure and because now they're getting their medication and because of the uh, nutritional aspect, uh, you know, because of all these things, um, because you're with uh, people that know how to deal with behaviors, sometimes you'll see the person with dementia appear almost better. And that leads some families to, oh, my gosh, did I make the right decision? Maybe, you know, mom shouldn't be here, or maybe my wife doesn't need to be here, or my husband, or whomever that loved one is. And I've actually seen several family members in, within a couple of weeks say, I, I'm going to move them back home. I can take care of them now. Look, it must have just, you know, something must have been wrong, and now it's okay. Within weeks, that person is being readmitted. Because the something that was wrong was the dementia, and that didn't go away. It just appeared to be um, uh, more easily managed because it's being managed by the experts. So I throw that cautionary statement out there. The other piece of advice I'm going to give is family members... It, I know, I know, I know, I can't stress that I know enough and I truly empathize with anybody that has to make this decision. It is truly, um, it, it's just, it, it's devastating. But one of the things that, that I've told families in the past is if this person really doesn't belong here, they're not going to stay here. You and I would not be placed somewhere that we didn't belong because we have the cognitive capabilities to, and the skill sets to implement and devise and initiate a way out. The person that's being transferred into a memory care unit does not. And because they don't leave, that, that's, that, there's the proof. And, and I, I hope that makes sense because that is really huge. Um, and I think it, it, once you really think about it and you let it sink in, yeah, this really is where mom belongs or dad or my husband or my wife. This is where they belong. I, I talked about um, support groups and, um, you know, educating yourself and, and, and really being the advocate for this person because it is so crucial that, um, that, they, that they are able to... Um, be transferred or transitioned into memory care and it be a positive experience. And uh, trust me, facilities also know that this is tough for you and they're there for you. Um, you should reach out to the staff at the facility and, you know, have these, um, you know, start communicating with them and discuss with them, you know, what are some of the things that you're really still having a difficult time with. Reach out to the other family members that have loved ones in that facility and form that relationship that's going to help you through this. Um, as I said, over time, that person with dementia, they really do transition in. They really do become acclimated, and they, they become a part of that home. And, you know, sadly enough, the majority of these dementias are progressive and they're terminal. So 
while you're educating yourself and preparing yourself and allowing yourself to make good informed decisions, not only now for that transition, you know, you're going to need that knowledge to be able to make decisions six months down the road, a year down the road, because more things are going to start happening as this disease progresses. And in order for you to be able to truly be an advocate for your loved one, you need to have that, that education and that knowledge. That about wraps up um, what I had to say today. And, and I hope that from some of this, somebody was able to pick out at least a, a, a tiny piece of advice or information that will be useful. Because, again, as I said, I really do understand, you know, how difficult this is for family members and decision makers. And, again, you know, it, it's, it's our role to assist the family so that we can, in turn, be true advocates for that person with dementia. Okay? I believe now I'm going to go ahead and um, answer some questions. So uh, if you'll bear with me, I'll figure out what I'm doing here. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, okay, question from Marilyn. How much control do I have over the care of my mother, especially in regard to who is caring for her? What if I notice that there is a particular individual who is causing anxiety for my mom? Great question. I have dealt with this in, in, my, um, uh, in, in my years of working at Freedom House and, you know, also being in long-term care for 25 years. You know, there's you in the facility, whatever facility is chosen, you guys got to build a relationship. You have got to start talking to that, those facility staff members. You've got to get to know them. You've got to build that relationship. It's got to be we're a team working for that person. And you, Marilyn, are a part of that team. And are you going to pick up on things and notice things that maybe the team doesn't? Yes, definitely. Um, as far as facility policies, each one is a little bit different. So depending on the staffing structure and the way the facility is laid out and depending on, um, um, you know, where, where individuals are assigned, call-ins, holidays, et cetera, you may not have 100% control over who's the one caring for your mother, but you do have some input. And I would say to just be very open and have those discussions with the facility staff and facility management. I have seen and I have made changes and I've helped uh, facilitate changes to some staffing patterns based on the personality of the staff member and the individuals they were caring for. Um, as I said earlier on, if you've ever heard me talk about dementia, I've talked about the diagnosis, but I've also talked about personalities. And we can't expect our caregivers, our paid caregivers, to be everything for everybody. And some people are really good with high-functioning residents. Others are just incredible with end stages and low functioning. Um, and some people just have that personality that they can just work with everybody. But if somebody is, is really causing anxiety with your mom, then you need to talk to the facility staff and try to work around ways. Um, of course, with the understanding that based on staffing patterns, this person may still have to engage with, with your mother, but I'm sure that through communication and through that relationship, we can help to, um, uh, you know, alleviate that anxiety as much as possible and reduce some of that interaction. Okay? Um, question from Kathy. What if my dad never seems to adjust to the environment? It happens. And, you know, earlier on I said that, you know, about 90, 95 percent of the residents that I've seen um, in my experience have adjusted. But there's always that 5 to 10 percent they don't adjust. Um, I know that for some families uh, what they have done is they have actually engaged the services of a companion or a sitter to provide one-on-one -on -one so that there's a little more time um, just spent on that person or perhaps outings, you know, because the facility, is, you know, they can only do so much, and, and we understand that. Um, so I know that for some family members, uh, you know, they've engaged the services of a private sitter. Um, I would say that if your father has never adjusted 
my experience would be it's not necessarily the facility, it's just his disease process, where he's at with that, and um, regardless of where he went, if it were another facility, there would not be an adjustment period. Um, as I said earlier, this is, this is just a devastating disease, and we don't have all of the answers, um, and, and we don't have you know, all of the advice and the tips to give to, to cure everybody's specific situation. But, you know, sometimes they're just, there are those that just don't adjust. The other thing that, that I would caution, though, and I would throw out is that I have seen, again, this is all just based on my own experience, I have seen where sometimes um, the person with dementia um, never seems to adjust in front of the family member. But when the family member um, is not there, this person is taking part in activities, this person is eating well, this person is, you know, um, uh, it doesn't exhibit any behaviors when that loved one's gone, et cetera. So I'd really, you know, communicate a little bit more with, with, the, with the facility and see if, if we can, cue, you know, find something. What is it that, that he enjoys? What is it that really makes his eyes sparkle um, and go from there? Oh, okay. Question from Pat. I feel like I'm betraying my mother by wanting to place her in a home she cared for me for 18 years. And if I can get through this without crying, it's going to be a miracle. This is what I'm talking about. This is, you know, oh my gosh, you know, um, what right do I have to make this decision? What right do I have? I should be able to take care of my mother myself. Um, look what she did for me. Look what she sacrificed for me. Um, this is selfish of me. I'm not a good child. I'm not a good daughter. You know, I, I should be there for her. She raised you for 18 years, yes, and, and she did what was in your best interest, and she was always your advocate, and she did it out of love and, and, and compassion um, and, and to some extent responsibility, right? Today's day and age, um, you know, we are either in the sandwich generation where we still have a family of our own that we're trying to raise or get through college and then we have aging parents. Um, it, it's not like it was 50, 60 years ago where somebody had the luxury, I'll say, of staying home and being the primary care provider. It's impossible to think that an individual, or even, you know, maybe there's one or two that pass it on, um, can provide the services that this person needs. You know, this dementia is progressive, and it's terminal, and it comes with so many signs and symptoms that it's, it's impossible to truly do what's in this person's best interest by keeping them at home and trying to manage that by yourself. I, I think that... You know, again, educate yourself. Make sure you understand that you really know how this disease process is going to uh, progress, what it really entails, and then answer the question, am I the person that can provide all of these needs that my mother needs, or can this facility that has the experts provide those, and then I'm there supplementing um, for my mother and still being her advocate? So I, I hope that answered your question. I, I know that's on, you know, probably in the forefront of everybody's mind, and, and this is just such an emotional process. It, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, question from Marie. What if the activities that my mom is used to aren't available in the facility? I would challenge the facility then to identify what are those activities. You know, none of us can, can remain stagnant. This is our program. This is what we do. This is the way we've always done it. You know, though, that, that era is out the door. Um, I, I would challenge that facility. Maybe you talk to the persons that's responsible for activities. Um, maybe you can help engage them in those activities. 
depending on what that activity is, what does that volunteer community have available out there. There are tons of resources available to us and to facilities, and it just takes somebody with some creativity, you know, to get out there and maybe find volunteers that can help introduce activities or different programs into that facility. Uh, you need to communicate with that facility. And if a facility is saying, oh, you know, we don't do that, um, we've never done that, we can't do that, um, you know, bring up, well, what about volunteers? What if I find somebody from, I don't know, the church group or, or whatever, you know, that's willing to come in um, and do this? That facility should, you know, jump at that opportunity. Okay. Um, from Rebecca, subject is boomers. I've been reading about the changes nursing homes are making for baby boomers. Is Air Force Villages making changes for boomers? Also, are you starting to see much dementia in the boomers? If so, what age? I would say that, yes, Air Force Villages is making huge changes um, for the boomers. And I guess, you know, um, it depends on what article you read, what magazine you're looking at. And I don't know if, if it's so much the boomers or if it's just society saying, well, yeah, it is a boomer um, 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 character trait, saying this is what I want and this is how I want it. Um, but it's also about us um, taking a more active role in our health care, being more aware, being more informed, and knowing, um, you know, what the expectations are. And so we're setting higher expectations. And I believe that the majority of long-term care is responding to these expectations. And we're saying, you know, we're getting rid of the, the, um, the uh, institutionalized, um, uh, you know, concept that we used to have. And, you know... We're going more towards, we're going to set up nursing homes and assisted livings for dementia like homes. Um, it is going to be a home. It is going to be a household model. It's going to be comfortable. It's going to be warm. Uh, we're going to be resident-centered, person-centered, whatever the buzzword is, you know, today. Um, so, yes, Air Force Villages is definitely uh, being proactive. As a matter of fact, um, you know, Freedom House is built on the neighborhood models. Uh, it was way ahead of its time uh, 13 years ago when it opened. And right now, Air Force Village One Healthcare Center uh, is in the process of building a brand new state-of-the-art skilled nursing facility called The Mission. And this is all focusing around person-centered care. Um, this is a home. Um, you know, this is where, where people come to um, thrive or, you know, really live out the rest of their days um, in comfort with, with the expectations that, that they have. Um, are you starting to see much dementia in the boomers? If so, what age? That would be a whole other topic. Um, uh, you know, since, since technically I'm, I'm on, the, on the cusp and I'm a baby boomer, um, I, I don't know if it's much about are we seeing more dementia um, as much as are we more aware of what dementia is. Um, and we also know that dementia really starts, you know, like Alzheimer's pathology really starts much, much earlier than diagnosis. You know, so the changes are starting in the brain much earlier before signs and symptoms start to appear and before somebody's diagnosed. So um, I don't have the answer to that question. I would assume that it's going to be the same um, uh, rate of incident that it is with any other generation. I would say, though, that when you look at the statistics for Alzheimer's and other dementias going from boom, 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 and then all of a sudden they spike up, it's because of that baby boomer, um, you know, era, you know, coming to that age group. So. Um, any suggestions for staff on when to approach families about transitioning from the assisted living unit to the memory care unit. Any suggestions for staff on when to, yeah, okay. So this is a, what we, you know, um, referenced this a little bit earlier in the presentation and we talked about sometimes um, the decision um, is not yours to make, it's gonna be made by if your loved one is residing in an assisted living facility and because of their changes and the progression of the dementia, that assisted living facility is no longer to meet, able to meet their needs, and 
they're going to need to transition to a memory care. I would say that for the assisted living staff, what are your policies? What is your disclosure statement? What are, um, you know, what have you set up and what have you discussed with the family on admission? You need to have those conversations up front. These are going to result in a requirement to transition to a memory care unit. If your loved one starts to exhibit X, Y, and Z, we're going to need to start talking about a transition to a memory care unit. It's really about having those discussions very early on, up front, so the expectations are there, um, versus trying to, um, you know, back paddle and, um, you know, plead your case, um, you know, later on. But you just need to be honest and open and talk about, you know, what are the needs that that, that person has now, how are you completely unable to meet them, and how is a memory care unit going to enhance this person's quality of life. And that's what it's all about, you know, enhancing their quality of life. Um, from Lisa and, and uh, my family members are not willing to talk about our elders and what to do. How do you get them to talk? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. I, I guess I'll take a shot at this. My family members are not willing to talk about our elders and what to do. How do you get them to talk? Um, would it be um, uh, your family members, your siblings, or um, other family members that are not wanting to approach the subject? And if that's the case, this is a tough one, and you're not alone in that. Um, I would, you know, really just, you know, keep, you just got to keep pushing it home. You got to show them you know, this is what's occurring, this is what's happening, give them literature, um, put stuff in their hands so they can read and, and start, you know, identifying with what are some of the issues and, you know, how to best handle those. Um, I hope I answered that question. I'm a little stumped on it, on, on what the actual intent was. Um, my time is just about up, and there are no further questions at this time, but if I didn't answer your question, I believe you can email those to MM Learn is that accurate, and uh, and those will will be answered. So again, I, I hope I shed some light for somebody somewhere um, to make that process a little bit easier. And uh, it's been a pleasure being here today, and thank you very much.